episode 55, James Fauntleroy, a.k.a. Jay Buffont. Jay Buffont is a show host and member of the YouTube network and activist org, Revolutionary Blackout Network. I've collaborated with Jay many times in the past, both on his show, my show, and different panels. But I never knew much about him. Who was the guy beyond the online presence? All I can say is buckle in. He has a heck of a story. Please welcome to the show, Jay Buffont. Yes, thank you for that. Everybody, Jay said hello to Lucy, which is uh, which is an important prerequisite on this show. Uh, James Fauntleroy, how you doing? James Fauntleroy, a.k.a. Jay Buffont, a.k.a. JB, part of the RBN network. We're going to dive into all of it. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. I am still sore from yesterday's workout. 445 pounds on the leg press, and I am kicking my own behind now because of it. So, yeah, that's how I'm feeling. <laughs> good for you, though. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it hasn't been, it's been a long time since I actually did a leg press, and so I was just like, what the hell am I getting myself into? And I'm like, you're one set in, you might as well go for three more. So that's what I did. There you go. So yeah. let, let's start at the beginning. Tell me a little bit about you and how you grew up. Where are you from? Has it always been Florida? No, actually, I'm originally from Camden, New Jersey. Uh, I was uh, born actually in Voorhees Township, New Jersey. Uh, so that was interesting. At the time, it was called West Jersey Hospital. And then I think they changed it to Voorhees Hospital or something like that. So, yeah, I was born there and I lived there uh, in Camden for the first three years of my life until we moved here to Florida. So what, what brought your family to Florida? Uh, drug, crimes, crack epidemic, um, lack of opportunity. Um, so, well, hey, it's the truth. You know, my mom uh, was raising three boys. I was the youngest of three. Mm -hmm. And so she saw as a single mother, she had three young sons and there was a, you know, gang activity. There was drugs and crime and she did not want to raise us in that type of environment. So you're, you're saying in Jersey, that was what was happening. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I, I thought, I thought you're making it out. Like that was what was going on in Florida. That's why you went there. I'm like, oh. I'm like, <laughs> We came to have fun. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> no, um, but we we left there uh, in 1987, uh, and it was um, it was a turbulent time, uh, especially because uh, you know you know you had the crack epidemic that was happening. You had you know a lot of the you know crime that was happening in. Me and my brothers, uh, my, you know, my mom was friends with a lady that uh, she had moved down here with her daughter. And so uh, she told my mom, hey, you know, if you want to get out of that, you can move down here. You can stay with us for, uh, you know, for a little bit until you get your own, your, yourself on your feet, you and your boys. So that's what we did. Uh, my mom uh, packed up her things and. Uh, and it was it didn't take long because uh, it was really almost spur of the moment. My mom didn't let my grandmom know until we were here. So it was. Yeah. And so it was a huge move. I, re I remember the Greyhound bus ride to Florida at three years old and uh, getting here. That bus ride. Oh, the bus ride is uh, well over 20 hours. Wow. Um, yeah, I slept a lot through it, but I remember par I remember pieces of that bus ride uh, riding to Florida and um, we moved there. And as we were there, um, you know, I don't want to say her name, but uh, we moved in with my mom's friend and her daughter. And uh, a couple months later. My mom's friend and her daughter moved back up to New Jersey. Wow. What was it? They just didn't like Florida anymore? Or? She got a new position 
I think she was a nurse and she got a new position at the hospital. Wow. And so she just up and left. And then we were homeless. And oh, wow. So, so you guys couldn't stay at the place. It was just, Hey, the place is done. And wow. Yep. yep. We had no place to go. So we had to move into shelters. So when I say that I know what it's like to be homeless as a child, I am literally saying I know what it's like to be homeless as a child. I remember I remember being in the homeless shelters at three years old. I remember them forcing us out to walk the streets because apparently after breakfast, you can't stay in the shelter. You have to go out into the street and walk the streets because I think... And I'm just assuming, but the idea was we don't want you to get um, used to just sitting around in the shelter. So you need to go out there and try to find something to to get yourself off off your feet. We got to remember, this is Florida, you know, especially in the 1980s. This wasn't, you know, New Jersey. And the thing is, it's like it's not like they wanted people to just sit on their behind and not do anything. That's not what these Northern States were doing either. But the thing is that Florida was more, they were, they weren't as favorable towards people who were down on their luck or poor or working poor or in poverty as say a state like New Jersey was. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it was tough because, you know, I remember being homeless and walking with my brothers in the winter time in Florida. And all we had was a couple of trash bags of stuff, some luggage and, um, you know, not too much, but, you know, my mom made it and I don't understand, you know, it's just out of real, just like grit, determination, Blessings and kind people that my mother was able to make it. Uh, she had a three-year-old, a five-year-old, and an 11-year-old. So Were you yeah. the youngest? I was the youngest. So yeah. what What eventually ended up happening for her? Like, did she just find a job and then she eventually could afford a place for you? Or, or how did all that happen? She found jobs. But, of course, you know, being a black woman in Florida in the 80s, I mean, they're not paying, you know, decent wages, um, you know, to my mom. And, of course, uh, she was able to work, you know, jobs at different places, you know, gas stations, bars, uh, grocery stores, fast food joints, stuff like that. But, um, you know, we made it work. And my mother always talks about this one story about how we were so poor that the only thing that we had in the house was neck bones and oatmeal. And that's what we had for dinner. Neck bones and oatmeal. Wait, what, what are neck? What's neck bones? I'm not sure. Neck bones is it's, it's, uh, it's, I think it's either beef or pork. I think it's beef, but they're, they're, uh, beef pieces that, you know, some of the pieces of beef are kind of settle into like bone a little bit. Oh, and okay. we call them neck bones. And so you had that. Uh, and then we also had, you know, the tub, you know, Quaker, you know, old fashioned oatmeal. Yeah. And that was it. And that was our dinner. You know, many a days I remember that those fried bologna sandwiches, they hit and those days were yeah. so good. <laughs> <laughs> Especially, you know, you get the the government cheese, you know, and then you get the the, the you know the French's, you know, mustard on that fried bologna sandwich. Whew, I'm telling you, boy, <laughs> that was some eating. So yeah, I remember those days, you know, and um, you know, I remember, you know, living in, you know, we were near downtown. And I remember going down to, you know, the the, the food stamp office and, and, you know, the WIC offices and stuff like that with my mom. Not the WIC offices, but the food stamp offices and um, the government assistance offices, you know, off of OBT. And uh, it was, you know, back in the day. And it was it was it was definitely a time, you know, I. 
it it really shaped me and showed me about you know living in poverty and living in a system that is unfair. And I'll be honest with you, no child deserves to live in those type of conditions. Like my mom made, she made it as good as she possibly could, you know, because, uh, you know, the system is designed to fail people because is it, it chooses a small group of people to be winners. And with my mom, you know, she she played the hand that she was dealt the best she could. And I'll be honest with you, she played it like a master, even though for her, she was bumping and getting herself bruised along the way. But I have nothing but praise to give her because, I mean, she was man- managed to raise three boys, you know, and so three young men. You know, in, in, in a capitalist system that, you know, I'll be honest with you, people like me are an endangered species. Black men, you know, I mean, the, the, the statistic is one out of three black men will go to prison. You know, and in the prison industrial complex, knowing what that is, that basically means that it sets us up to be put back into a form of chattel slavery once again. And, you know, looking at how, you know, the statistics in the system is really, it feels like it's out for me. The fact is that, you know, my mom did an amazing job, you know, uh, with the three of us. And so I'm just eternally grateful for, to her and all her hard work. How are you, you guys know? so close? We still, we still joke and poke at each other. Yeah. <laughs> we still, Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing I and this I think this is uh, one of the reasons why I appreciate you so much is because as somebody who's into humor, somebody that's uh, has a I was watching uh, the interview with Marlon Wayans on Shannon Sharp actually earlier today. And one of the things that he said was the most beautiful was he said his job, he said he's here to, on this earth to collect smiles. Right. Mm-hmm. And I view people like you as people like you and Lee Camp. You're here to collect smiles. You're here to help that. And being raised in a family similar to his, because I was also raised Joe's witness as well, is that we were a type of family where laughter is our thing. Like, that's how we got through a lot of it. Like, you know, my mom was funny and we had goofy sides to us. And this is why I am the way I am now is because of we use our humor in order to get through the tough times in our family. And that has bred into the next generation. Now our next generation is also very funny, but I, you know, I feel like, yeah, you know, as far as the contact with the family, you know, that's what keeps us together is the humor. Uh, you know, my brother just turned, you know, 48. And so, of course, my other brother was, you know, ripping on him for turning 48. So (laughs) we're all in our 40s now. And so it's just it's fun, you know, because, you know, they they rip on each other. But it's all love. And, you know, that's one thing I appreciate. Did you say you were raised Jehovah's Witness? Yes. I did not know that about you. Yeah, I uh, actually uh, was Jehovah's Witness for almost 20 years. Okay. What? What was that like? Because I, I have I have I have Jehovah's Witnesses yeah. in my family. I I don't talk about it much, but I do have Jehovah's Witnesses in my family. Uh, but no one else in my family is one. Um, so it's uh, it, it, it's sort of an interesting thing to see. I, yeah. I've had some people that are ex Jehovah's Witnesses on this show, kind of talk about it in depthly, and yeah. I mean I. I I don't have any religion in my life, but, um, but yeah, yeah. What was, talk about that for a bit. What was that like? It's interesting because, um, while I grew up very, very heavily religious, one thing I can definitely say about the organization and really when I say the organization, I mean the people within the organization, as you would call rank and file, the Mm -hmm. publishers, right? Very loving, 
kind people, deeply devoted to being as kind and compassionate as possible. That is the one thing that you can never take away from me that I will always acknowledge that. Um, growing up, it was interesting because I remember going to the Keenum Hall for the first time when I was five years old. Did you go door to door and stuff like that? I did. We did. Um, in fact, I started going door to door and speaking on my own at I think around eight or nine. Um, and then, yeah, I got baptized at 14 and I ended up leaving. Uh, so at 14, I was a full blown, full fledged old witness. Uh, it was January 2nd, 1998. At the Daytona Beach Assembly Hall. And I remember this also because we were the first group baptized at the Daytona Beach Assembly Hall because it was a brand new built assembly hall that we also helped build because Joe's Witnesses, they don't use actual, they use for like the very basics, like like higher construction crews, but they actually use the community of Joe's Witnesses themselves to build. Wow. And so uh, we all volunteer. And if you're under the age of 18, then there's only certain things you can do, you know. And for us, it was mostly like clean up and stuff. But so we helped build that hall. And it's a smart business model. You got to you got to give it to these churches, man. It's a smart business model. They're like, what? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I grew up Catholic. And when I think about all the people I do who did like free accounting services and free bookkeeping and free like, oh. it's mm-hmm. like that's a pretty smart business model <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah and but the thing that's the thing about Jehovah's Witnesses though Jehovah's Witnesses is a 100% you know voluntary organization none of the elders get paid um you know uh none of the you know everybody who is a Jehovah's Witness is considered an ordained minister so you know, it's, you know, everything is through voluntary donations. There's never a collection plate pass or anything like that. Like back in the day, you see like boxes where you went and you put in whatever you felt. If you didn't have anything or if you didn't want to put anything, you just nobody looked at you funny. So that was the difference between that and a, and a traditional church. Like Joe's Witnesses, they are Christians. Mm-hmm. The thing is, is that, you know, it's it, their model is you give up your heart and you don't have to feel any type of obligation in order to do it. Um, but yeah, so, you know, uh, from then on, you know, I grew up, uh, going door to door, um, for years. Uh, and then after I'd say, uh, after I turned 33, which is kind of an interesting age, (laughs) uh, I turned 33, um, you know, I got kicked out. Um, out? what did you do? Uh, I lived my gay lifestyle basically. Oh, um, oh wow. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, they are, so, they are not friendly to, I mean, I, I kind of, I guess I kind of figured, yeah. but I didn't know they would yeah. kick you out for that. Yeah. Well, the thing is, it's like, it's not necessarily for being gay. It's for, immorality so it's it, it, it and it's more of you know you didn't you know you're not repentant you know what i'm saying yeah yeah because i mean there are people who are probably still gay they're joe's witnesses but they're not living their life um as a, a gay person or you know they're a lesbian they're you know they're just single and just hoping for, you know, uh, the new world that God ushers in in order for them to live, you know, the life where they're supposed to. And so that's got to be so hard. I mean, that that's well. So how is. did you how did you kind of digest all that? I mean, how did you feel? Did you feel betrayal did you feel bad were you kind of like well screw you guys like was it a little bit of everything like where were you at no and i'm gonna tell you why no well no what like what did you feel Hmm? 
what, what, uh, like, what, what were you saying no to? Like, like what? No, I didn't feel betrayed. I didn't okay. feel, I didn't feel hurt. Um, because I knew when you get baptized, you cannot get baptized unless you have a full understanding of why you're getting baptized. And in the, in the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses, they do not baptize babies. They do not baptize little children. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the youngest I ever heard getting baptized was nine. But that kid was like a genius. And they understood a lot more than what they should have at that age. Yeah, like, right? Genius kid. We're going to fast track this one. He's smart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but for the most part, I think the youngest they typically baptize, I see, is between 12 and up. Right. Mm -hmm. Because we, you know, you know, you know, what's what. And so I was 14. And the thing is, like, I know I knew that I was gay since. Eight, seven, eight years old. I knew what what, how did like what what made you know, like, was there a particular happening or was it just you just kind of knew? I knew, and uh, funny thing about elementary school is uh, you find out pretty quickly. <laughs> Interesting. And, okay. Yeah, and uh, you know, of course, you know, and as seven, eight years old, you know, I was looking at boys. I wasn't looking at girls, you know, my age, and so I, you know, I realized it. And then uh, when puberty hit, well. <laughs> You know, fireworks. And so, um, of course, I knew that, but at the same time, I kept it inside because, you know, of course, I didn't want to reveal that. But, you know, because, you know, shame and guilt, things like that, you know, and so I got baptized knowing that part about me. But I wanted to please God. And also, you know, now that I think about it, because hindsight's always twenty twenty. I also wanted to please, you know, my mom and the community of, you know, the brothers and sisters, the elders. And, you know, I, I was I really doing it for myself? I think I wanted to do it for myself, but I was really doing it for others. Um, and so... When I, when I, you know, was getting kicked out, I actually felt like it was necessary. Uh, I felt like if I'm going to live, I'm going to live as authentically as possible. I do not want to live a double life anymore. Here's my thing. If you're going to be a Jehovah's Witness, you got to be a Jehovah's Witness. There ain't no two stepping in. You have to be one. There is no like uh, living your life, you know, in one foot and out the other. Now, you're either going to be one 100 percent or you're going to be zero percent. That's it. And so I was living my life, you know, half one way and half the other way, trying to walk this line. And it just didn't work. So by the time I hit 33 and they found out, I was just like, yeah, y'all need to kick me out. So was there like a process? Like, is there like, was there a thing where they said, Hey, you're kicked out or was it just like, yeah. So when a transgression is made and they find out they approach you, um, and it has to be, you know, evidence, evidence can be, you know, multiple people knowing about whatever you may have done or it, could be, you know, you going to them uh, and just saying, hey, I did this. So, of course, I was uh, approached and when, and it was pretty public. It it was something I said on social media, something that would seem innocuous in 2024, right? But uh, I was confronted and I said yes. And so then we had a meeting. And in the meeting, we talked about it. And I basically said, yeah, this is me. This is who I am. And, uh, you know, can't do anything out of wedlock. So I did. 
So then it was basically, yeah, yeah. Um, How did your mom feel about all that? She was heartbroken about the situation, but she hugged me and let me know that she'll always love me. That's awesome. And our relationship is still strong. Um, is she still Jehovah's Witness? Yes, she is. Yeah. Very, very dedicated. Um, and so that's her path. And um, I'm proud of her, you know, for sticking, you know, with something that is right for her. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I realized that it helped me develop into who I am. That's one thing I am definitely grateful to that organization for is helping me to develop into the person who I am today. Uh, But I feel like it was a season in my life and that season is over. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, so yeah. I mean, that's a healthy outlook, man. I mean, I feel like that's the best way to look at it. It, It's uh, the last person I had on my show. Um, What's the word for when you lead, like you're an apothecate? Apostate. Apostate. Where were you? So she is an apostate. And she, oh. you know, she, I mean, she was also abused and, and, and stuff like that in the church. So, yeah. you know, it's one of those situations. But, uh, yeah. So it, everybody's, a lot of people have different experiences, just like being uh, siblings to the same parent. You know, you may have had the same parent, but you have different experiences with that parent. Of course. And so for me, my experiences, you know, I did have some negative experiences, but nothing that was traumatic. You know what I mean? Um, And so I I can only speak from my lived experience. But, yeah, some people um, who are just fellowship, uh, some... uh, feel that there is, you know, the organization is not good in their eyes. And so, you know, um, I mean, it's always going to be a thing. I mean, look, I, I was raised Catholic and, and similar to what you're talking about. I never had any of those experiences you hear about on the news. Thank goodness. Um, now I had some bad experiences as far as learning. This isn't for me. And eventually I made the decision that this isn't for me. This isn't something I want to be part of my life. And, you know, I, I still have some friends and family who practice and kind of like you, I'm like, Hey, that's your path. That's cool. Um, you know, sometimes we just kind of talk about it, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I learned that, uh, that it, it's not something for me. And then I kind of feel that way about just religion in general, just based yeah. on my own lived experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, so, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, your health issues. I know you talk about it some on your show. So uh, go into that for me. Yeah. So it, it, you kind of have to get the backstory. So back when I was eight, nine years old, so I read the doctor's notes from way back then. This was 1992, 1993. Um, and I read the doctor's notes and it basically said that I was at that time I was complaining of back pain. And what eight year old do you know that has back pain? And so uh, apparently I was referred to a pediatric nephrologist. And so my mom had me see a pediatric nephrologist. Then they tested me um, for what was known as nephrotic syndrome. I had a kidney biopsy when I was nine. And so it was my first surgery ever, ever having having to have general anesthesia. And so you can imagine, uh, and I can tell you right now, uh, I remember it was Dr. Aravani, who was the pediatric neurologist. He was working out of Florida hospital at the time. Now it's called Advent Health. And... I remember going to the hospital, they put the IV in and everything, and they were wheeling me to the OR. And a clown stopped to try to cheer me up before the operation. 
And I was like, who in the hell sent a clown to try to cheer me up? And my <laughs> nine-year-old, my oh, uncle. Like, no. I was like, like, I guess at nine, you're a little old for that. Yeah. I'm like, Cirque du Soleil would have been cool. Right. Clown? No. Uh, so <laughs> it was the just. clown had a tough audience. Yeah, very tough audience. Yeah. <laughs> like, 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 I felt like I was being gagged, but. It was, uh, you know, I had the operation um, and then they confirmed that I had nephrotic syndrome. Um, And then that was pretty much it. Uh, I was on some medications, but I completely forgot about it. I was a bit of a chubby kid. Um, And then by the time I hit 11 years old, we had visited my grandmother back in New Jersey um, my grandmother, you know, my mom was really concerned about my health. So my grandmother helped me lose a whole bunch of weight over the summer. Um, and you'd be surprised what some, some baked chicken and broccoli and walking around a lake will do for an 11 year old. Yeah, and go. so by the time I came back, I looked like a normal size 11 year old. I was actually skinny for once. I was shocked. Um, my mother didn't, recognized me because she has sent me there for the summer. But once I got back, um, as I started to get older through my teenage years, I started noticing that my right leg started swelling. I didn't give it much thought and it started swelling, getting bigger. Um, and by the time I was in my twenties, I just got used to having one leg bigger than the other. I just didn't realize what was going on. I never, I never went to the doctor when I did have health insurance because I was afraid of paying a deductible and having co-pays and stuff. So I just didn't go uh, until one day I was working uh, at a dinner show. Um, And so I started having uh, blurred vision and dizziness at the same time. And weeks before that, I felt like I had a cold and a stomach flu at the same time. So this is 20s now. Yeah, 20s, uh, early 20s. And so I felt like I had a cold and a stomach flu at the same time, which is weird. And and then once I, you know, uh, I I remember having a, a, a hot toddy because my mom was like, take a hot toddy. You should feel better. And then... Um, that one's kind of graphic. It's not, you know, but I'll keep cleaning it up. But I took the hot toddy and then next thing you know, uh, you know, vomited and then more than vomit came out. Oh, no. It, oh, yeah, man. yeah, yeah. It looked like it looked like a murder scene in the bathroom. But, oh, no. but the thing is, it's like, I didn't know what was going on. And then once I was at work, and then I had the vision blurring and the dizziness. I was like, something's wrong. Called my mother. She was living in back in New Jersey at the time. And then she told me to go to the hospital. I went to the hospital, sat in the old, and sorry, the ER for about seven hours. Oh uh, yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Medi- yeah. This is our, you know, healthcare system. And so they took me back and they said, we think there's something wrong with your kidneys. And then all their memories from when I was little came flooding back about my kidneys. And so then I was sitting in the hospital room and this guy comes in and he said, he's a nephrologist. And he told me, you're going to have to go on dialysis. You have kidney failure. And when I found that out, I was just in shock. And my, I called my mom and my mom was like, I knew they say you had to go on dialysis. And I was like, what do you mean? What do you mean you knew? But then I remember from back in the day that I had kidney issues when I was really little. Mm-hmm. So it just started to make sense. Like, oh, you know, the thing is, I didn't keep up with my health. Especially, you know, it was kind of hard for my mom to um, when I was a teenager. But then I didn't really keep up with it as a young adult because I just, uh, you know, financially, it was 
hard, you know, especially, you know, being, I was what you would call underinsured, you know? Um, and so once I had my, uh, first dialysis treatment, which was scary, because of course, you know, you have to go into, uh, it's not, it's not a big surgery, you know, it's kind of a minor surgery, but they still put you under, you know, they had to put a perm cath in my chest with a tube coming out of your chest. And then they hook it up to the dialysis machine. So you got the arterial and venous. And then, uh, my first dialysis and it's, it was three hour long dialysis treatment. I was so scared. I was staring at the machine the entire time for all three hours. I was scared because I was afraid it was going to hurt. Fortunately, it does not hurt, but it is very taxing, very exhausting. So by the time you're you're done, drained, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, my first time after that, it was interesting because as soon as I got up out of the hospital bed after dialysis, I felt like I was so light that I can go through the roof hmm. because the thing about dialysis is that it not only cleans the blood, but it also pulls excess fluid out of your vascular space. Okay. And so uh, because your kidneys aren't working, your kidneys t- typically pull out impurities and fluid from your vascular space and then they deliver it to your bladder. So then your bladder executes it. Mm -hmm. And if your kidneys aren't working right, they're not really going to be pulling that fluid. So I had excess fluid. That's why my leg was so big and that's called edema Mm. where your tissue is, is retaining a lot of water. And so immediately my leg started shrinking back to normal size because my body was actually getting proper dialysis again. So every human being, healthy human being goes through dialysis 24 hours a day, seven days a week, your kidneys dialyze your blood. Like you're literally going through dialysis right now, (laughs) you know, but for me it's because it's three days a week and only three and a half to four hours each treatment that hit of, you know, dialysis is taxing on the body. Yeah. So you go three times a week. Three times a week. Yeah. And you've been doing that since your early 20s. 16 years. It'll be 17 years next May. So, I mean, are you and I I only know so much about this stuff. So, I mean, are you hoping for a transplant or or, or how does all that work? I mean, they have like registries and stuff, right? Or or what's the situation Mm -hmm. there? Yeah. So I'm actually in the process of working on transplant. I have to get one more test done. Once I get that test done, then it is sent to the board to either approve or disapprove uh, based on my test results. Or if I need some other things to be done, then they can say, oh, you just need this other thing to be done. Uh, another test to be done, and then uh, then I can eventually get put on the list. Uh, I've been told many times that I'm a great candidate because I am young to be on the list. Even though I just turned 40, I'm young to be on that list. So uh, I am trying to get that done right now um, because it is exhausting, you know, three times a week, a every week for 16 years. It is exhausting, and uh, I, I want to improve my quality of life as a activist. I want to an organizer. I want to improve my quality of life so I can be better on the ground, and then also it'll be better for me, you know, my family, you know, to you know have this better quality of life so that I can be more available for them. Uh, so yeah, uh, I, I want to do that, and it's. It's a, it's a process, but, you know, my whole family's behind me and trying to make sure that gets done. And uh, I hope, hopefully I can get this uh, one more test done and then hopefully there's no more barriers, but if there's any barriers, I'll just, I'll clear them, you know, as yeah. they come along Hell and yeah. then, you know, get myself a transplant and then I'll be on my way to doing bigger, better, bigger, better things. So uh, what got you into activism and how did you find RBN? Yeah, so it was 
back in 2018. So uh, just uh, a reminder, after, you know, the organization of Joe's Witnesses, they are not political at all. And so uh, I, I was interested in the political sphere, but I didn't vote and I didn't participate. And I really didn't have political discussions because we were, you know, it was basically, you know, no man can actually change things in a positive way. Only God can. So you just leave it alone. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then after I got kicked out, what I did was, I started becoming more interested. And at the time you had Andrew Gillum that was running for governor here in Florida. Andrew Gillum was running on Medicare for all. And during the Florida democratic primaries, Bernie Sanders endorsed Andrew Gillum. And that was a huge deal. I knew nothing really about Bernie Sanders though. Um, And so of course, you know, I had went into left to, I stumbled into it. Funny enough, um, basically in the independent media space, some of my earliest introductions in independent media was actually Alex Jones, which Mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know. Um, But this was early Alex Jones talking about like the Bilderberg group and conspiracies and all this other stuff. And so, but for some reason, he just didn't, like after a while, this just wasn't, it didn't seem right to me. I, I can't imagine not why me. someone wouldn't connect with yeah. the guy. I can't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, actually, a lot of people, that's not the most far off story in the world. And a lot of people don't yeah. like to talk about that. But I mean, I know a couple leftists at their first introduction into, you know, beyond binary politics. And I don't even know if you could call Alex Jones politics, but but it's like they found Alex Jones and then. Fortunately, from there, they found better, better grounded stuff. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that's totally unheard of. And th- there's probably more because people don't want to admit that. But hey, I yeah. mean, whatever, whatever was your gateway was your gateway. I don't, I don't think it's something people should be ashamed of. No, I, I mean, first it was Alex Jones. And then I remember one time I was flipping. I was going through YouTube and then I found this thing about Rachel Maddow, because I used to watch MSNBC. I used to like Rachel Maddow. The, she, was, yeah. she was different a long time ago. Yeah, a long time ago in the galaxy far, far away, Rachel Maddow was, you know, she was it. You would, um, you would wonder how she got away with all that stuff. You're like, how did they let her get away with that? And then, yeah. It's not yeah. anymore, but. No, but, um, you know, I remember one time I was I, I tuned in to Kyle Kalinske and he was talking about Rachel Maddow and he was talking about Russiagate. And I was like, hmm. And then he touched on somehow he touched on Medicare for all. Mm. And when I heard what Medicare for all was, I was like, wait a minute. You can have health care guaranteed without having to have it as part of your job. <laughs> I was like, what? The rest of and, the industrialized world already has this? What? <laughs> yeah, I was like, what? So once I heard that, I started watching him. Then it introduced me to TYT and David Dole and Mike Figueredo, right? Um, and so I started getting into it. And then I started, and then I had a Twitter account from back in 2008. But I never actually really used it. I tried to like, you know, use it to like grow, you know, like I wanted to be like a voiceover and I tried to do something with it, but it never did. Oh, you still can. You got, you know how much I love your voice. Oh, no. I I promised myself I wasn't going to gush out because every time we collaborate, I'm like, oh, that voice. You got such a great, I wish I had your voice. Oh, thank you. You still can. you. You, You are perfect for voiceover. Thank you. you should Thank be. You. I, I mean, are, do you have anyone in Orlando who shops you around for that? <sighs> no, I. I honestly feel like I, I would love to. Actually, you know what's interesting? Back in 2019, 2020, I did voiceovers for the Green Party. Yeah. 
Yeah. Let, let me see if I can find some stuff out for you. I'm, obviously, I'm located a far way away from Orlando, but I yeah. might. I mean, you know, I I was just on the road for so long. I I might, you know, yeah. Anyway, but mm-hmm. uh, but yeah. but continue with. Well, uh, <laughs> well, and if I were to do voiceovers, I would want to do it. You know, I mean, I would want to do it for good causes, like let's say if there was a third party candidate that needed somebody to do a voiceover. Now, of course, I would need to grill them about their beliefs and their policies and stuff. And then if they seem all right with me, then yeah, I'd be like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll lend you my voice, you know, or if there was like, a, a, a like say somebody doing a documentary about homelessness or something like that. They want somebody to be the the narrator or something like that. Definitely. Hell yeah. You know, I mean, I, I'll lend my voice to stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, so I wanted to do voiceovers and things like that, but, uh, I just left it alone. So by, by the time we hit 2019, I jumped back into my Twitter and I started finding people. Like I started, you know, looking up things like Medicare for all. And then next thing you know, I started looking up Bernie Sanders and then I found his platform and I started to get excited about that because then I also was thinking about our planet and how, you know, look, Captain Planet and the Planeteers, baby, that I am that yeah. kid. And yeah, man, you know, We're both sweating it out in the heat as we speak. And it's September. Yeah, 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 something's happening on, the, and we're on different. We're totally on the opposite coast. You're in Florida, I'm in California, and we're both sweating it out. Yep, yep. And so, um, you know, that was also a concern for me. And so, once I learned about his policies, I got excited about the Bernie Sanders campaign. Once the Bernie Sanders campaign got off the ground, um, you know. I started realizing that the other candidates were just a no-go. So you can say I was Bernie or bust. I was. Um, And so by the time I saw Bernie essentially get cheated and then drop out, I heard about, at the time, Howie Hawkins. Um, I had heard about Dr. Joe Stein in 2016. Wait, one, and, one, quick, one quick question before you jump into Howie. When the Bernie, when it happened in 2020, were you, because you said you didn't really start tuning in much until 2018. So were, were there people who told you, by the way, this happened the first time? Or did, did you already know at that point? <laughs> I saw, I saw a Michael Moore documentary about it. Oh, Okay. Which one was it? Was it Capitalism a Love Story? It was a Michael Moore documentary where he actually talked about... The timing would have been Capitalism a Love Story, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and talked about how, uh, you know, the rise of Donald Trump and how they all said that Donald Trump wasn't going to win and then how uh, Hillary Clinton actually ended up um, essentially cheating out Bernie Sanders in 2016. Um. And so that's how I learned about what was going on in 2020. And I was just like, I mean, in 2016. So I was just like, man, I can't go with these people if they're cheating out candidates. And so, of course, you know, and I heard, you know, everybody, you know, who was in lefty media rave about Dr. Jill Stein. I was like, okay, cool. But she's not running. So I was like, all right, well, if Bernie ends up not winning, I'm not going with anybody else. I'm going to the Green Party. Mm-hmm. So that's what I did. I voted for Howie Hawkins. Um, and uh, once I did that, uh, I was very vocal on Twitter. And I saw certain people who were making a lot of noise. One of them being Nick Cruz, Socialist MMA. <laughs> Uh, He was making a lot of noise and I was making a lot of noise. Um, And then him and Rome, especially. Uh, And then I I still remember when someone first pointed me to Rome. I did. I think, well, I think it was, I think Nick, I bet first. And then I think I was, because I always was into mutual aid. Like I always paid attention to it, tried to help out in my community. 
and I was I did some kind of episode about it. This was some years ago, and I think it was Nick who hit me up and he goes, "You gotta, you gotta check out the Sky Rome." And 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 as, and as soon as he said Detroit, I was like, "Oh, I'm in." I was like, "I I gotta talk to this guy immediately." Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, Rome's awesome. Been, been a Rome fan ever since. Yeah, uh, and you know, um, you know, seeing how they were online, it just sparked something. And, you know, cause I started talking about housing for all, I started talking about Medicare for all, I started talking about how the system, you know, it's not good for any of us. And growing up shows when this, we were taught that the political system is not to be trusted. Mm-hmm. That's what we were taught because, because we were taught that, you know, about greed and selfishness and how a lot of them will use the political system in order to, you know, further their, their aims. So of course, you know, I had no trust in the system from the outset. Right. Uh, so going into, uh, 2021, Nick had this podcast called the black Rose brigade. And it was a bunch of us who were black and on the left that were speaking, you know, in a podcast. So it was myself, uh, Compton J, known as CJ, Rome, RJ, Jackie, and Nick. And we had a meeting afterwards because they wanted to meet. And this is literally... This was actually my second time being propositioned with being part of a podcast. Mm-hmm. The first one didn't work out because there was this whole breakup between the forced to vote. Uh, crowd. Oh, really? Yeah, it was. There was like yeah. a was that an R like a later RBN thing, or was this like just other people online? No, it, it was it was before RB. It, it was before Fred Hampton left us. <laughs> oh, okay, I got you. Yeah, yeah, that's how early it was. Um, and so then I got proposed with this, and so they wanted to me, and they said, "I think we should make a, a an actual group." Mm-hmm. And that group, you know, we thought about a name, and we actually loved. We were inspired by people like Fred Hampton. Mm-hmm. And it, it was coincidental that a movie about Fred Hampton came out that you know that same time, that spring. Um, and so we started uh, FHL on April first, twenty twenty one, and we were like, "Yes, it's April Fool's Day, but this is no joke." Mm. And we started it, and we had got. You know, it's because of our connections on Twitter, we hit the ground running. We had some Mm -hmm. big names already early, you know, and it was great uh, being able to speak to all these different, you know, people. Uh, Fast forward. And then we changed our name to uh, RBN. I think it was uh, late 2021. I think it was November 2021 Mm -hmm. where I changed not change, but I decided that I wanted to also have my own channel as well because mm-hmm. we had added in, you know, Savvy Sabs about a month or two after we started. Um, and then I saw that she still had her own channel and I was like, you know what? I need to have my own channel too. I wanted to. And so that's what I did. And I got my own channel. Nice. And so uh, that doing that with RBN, and I've been doing that ever since. But I kept moving further and further to the left the more I learned. And so then, because I started out, I was basically a progressive. Then I went from progressive to social democrat. Then I went from social democrat to democratic socialist. Then I went from democratic socialist to socialist. Mm-hmm. And then I went from socialist to, no, first I said libertarian socialist was cringe. I was like, what in the hell is that? Well, I feel, then, I feel like that term's been sort of reassessed. I mean, it used to be a clear-defined thing. Now it's a little bit 
like like it depends on who you say it to i mean i i always say if i had to check one box eco socialist would be the clearest one like like, like i would yeah. say eco socialist for me but i mean i i got some things that are you know little communist little anarchist a lot of socialist you know and I, I don't think there's any total one thing that's like a hundred percent all except for anti-capitalist but i don't want to be defined by what i'm against you know what i mean uh, that's true and that that's very fair um so uh, i i moved all the way to and, and i have to credit this with nick and rome especially they shoved my ass to the left <laughs> they right said on. they said come on dude you're coming with us and i was just like okay <laughs> <And> so <laughs> so now i consider myself a full-blown commie um and uh you know, the funny part about it is, is that something about it never, I was never afraid of it mm-hmm. because it was like, what did they actually do that was horrible? And people will talk about, well, they did these things, they did those things. And it's like, is that accurate according to the, the, the actual history of you know, communists. And it's like, when you find out that, uh, you know, there, there's stories are, you know, either misconstrued or told wrong, or a lot of times somebody who has capitalist proclivities, they will try to us you into the other system. Then right. come well, to find out, it's but, like, it's like any experiment can be taken into an authoritarian place. And for, for some reason, people have used, well, we all know the reason, but but yeah, for yeah. the obvious reasons, people have used that to completely demonize all of communism. They never hold capitalism to the same scrutiny. They never no. do it. Any any experiment can go can, can go an authoritarian route, and usually it, it's a couple just infiltrators yeah. that that are that are responsible. And for yeah. some reason communism has been eternally defined that well that's it but capitalism we always make excuses for even though it fails miserably every single freaking time it's tried and goes into authoritarianism every time because it's set up to do that uh yeah. but yeah well i don't preach it to the choir but oh yeah uh, here's the thing though oh pretty much every system you think about is authoritarian in some way the question is Whose authority? Right? Would I rather have an authoritarian system where the authority is the corporations mm. and people who are devoted to making as much capital or money as possible? Or do I want to have a system of authority where it's ruled by the workers, the majority of actual people? Yeah. And it's not ruled by and it's not ruled by money or capital but just by humans wanting to collectively survive and thrive by actually having a symbiotic relationship with one another yeah. called a society. And the thing is, is like when you look at the root words of like socialism, it's social. The root word of communism is community, right? right. The thing right. is, what is the root word of capitalism? Exactly. Exactly. You know? I mean, it's right yeah. there. It's right oh, there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I would just say it's like when it's communal, it, it's not necessarily authoritarianism. It just means there are rules because, you know, like anything else, there's rules. <laughs> you, you know, it's just yes. it's just rules determined by the community. Uh, thanks so much for doing this, man. And tell everybody where they can go learn more about you. Oh, man, it's over already. It's over already, man. We did like an hour. We were just getting started, man. <laughs> I mean, look. I appreciate you, you saying that. I appreciate yo, you saying that. You and me, we we can we can talk, man. It, it's a good thing I'm I not agree. in California. I, loved, I love doing your show. I always love when you invite me to do your show. I always have a wonderful time, and and I I'm really glad that I got to actually know you better. I mean, I, I didn't know a lot of this about you. I knew some of it. I didn't know mm-hmm. a lot of this about. It. That's why I'm doing this series. I want more peaks under the hood of uh of people you know people that interest me yeah uh, some yeah of them I, i've I, already collaborated with but never knew this about them yeah i appreciate you having me on to be able to find out more about me you know it's just 
you know, it's, it's, I think one of the good things about shows like this is that it gives the uh, person opportunity to really just breathe. And then you get to know, okay, this is their journey. And it also humanizes the person while, and then on top of it, you get to see, hey, I'm not that much different Mm -hmm. from And then you get to see, well, you get to see yourselves in other people. And that's one of the reasons why, especially when I talk about, you know, liberation of different groups, especially marginalized groups, is to see yourself in other marginalized groups. You know, like, for instance, you and I very clearly see ourselves in people like the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Right. We see ourselves in the people in Congo. We see ourselves in the people of Haiti. Hell, we see ourselves in the people, you see yourself in the people who are in Skid Row. I see myself in the people on Terry Avenue. You know what I'm saying? The unhoused people. Like, we see ourselves in those people because we're human beings. And if if we did subscribe to a religion, it would be a religion of compassion, love, and kindness. And that's it. And I think that's the beautiful part about those of us who are on the left. We see humanity as, uh, you know, something to be cherished and, you know, we accept people for who they are as long as it doesn't harm somebody else. There's acceptance there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, that's beautiful. But uh, you forgot to plug your channel. Please don't. Please, (laughs) please plug your channel, though. (laughs) That was really powerful oh, stuff, but, but don't forget to tell people where to find you. <laughs> I want them to be able to find you. Yeah, you guys can find me on Revolutionary Blackout Network, so you can find me there on uh, Sundays and Thursdays. Uh, you can go there on YouTube, uh, YouTube, Rockfin, and Rumble. Uh, and then you can find me on my channel, JB Font. You can find me there on YouTube, Rockfin, Rumble, Twitch, and Twitter. Uh, JB font is for basically all my socials. You can find me there on, uh, I don't know what's going on with my TikTok right now. For some reason, TikTok is glitching. Apparently I'm, I'm banned. Apparently I'm not. I don't know. It's a whole nother thing, but, uh, also you can find me on Twitter, uh, Instagram and, uh, Twitter, Instagram. I think that's it. Yeah, there's some, there's yeah, there's some billion and five. I mean, there's yeah. reds, blue sky, blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah, I don't have blue sky actually. I'm on it. I'm not. Su- I mean, I just kind of cross post everywhere. But yeah, what are you gonna do? I, That's I, 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 I had higher hopes for that thing. It it never quite caught on the way I was hoping it would. But uh, yeah. James, thanks so much for doing this, man. And uh, it's uh, it's great to know you. Thank you so much. It was great to uh, be asked these questions. That was actually really good questions, by the way. Thank you so much. That was Jay Buffon. Be sure to check out all of his stuff. Revolutionary Blackout Network on YouTube and his show. Music for the 1000 Podcast is provided by Andrew Saxon. Now be sure to check out his podcast, the Baywatching Podcast, wherever you get your podcast. Also, if you want to support the show on the sustainability end, you can do so over patreon.com slash romplacone. For a give what you can level, you get all kinds of exclusive perks. I'm doing Zoom shows again for patrons. We're going to have exclusive screenings and events around upcoming productions. I'm working on a documentary the public doesn't know a thing about yet. You can join this community for a give what you can level. Even a dollar a month goes a long way. And last but not least, I wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who came out to all of the Left at Wall screenings. We finally concluded the screening season in London on September 21st, last week, we concluded the screenings. So thank you to everyone who came out in Tucson, Washington, D.C., Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Los Angeles, Idlewild, and London. And, of course, everyone who came out to the virtual screenings as well online. We are moving on to the next phase of Left at Wall, and I can't wait. We'll have some news very, very soon. In the meantime, 55, a bit closer to 60. We'll see you next week. Hey guys, Ron Placone here. Take your own 1,000 challenge. No, you don't need to interview 1,000 people, although if you want to do that, go for it. Your 1,000 challenge can be whatever you want. Maybe you want to call a friend out of the blue once a week. Maybe you want to read a book every month. 
Maybe you want to start a different garden every season. I, I guess that might be dependent on where you live. Look, the point of the challenge is taking on an endeavor that enriches your life in some way, and it can be measured. And then, of course, you do it regularly. That's what 1000 is doing for me and hopefully for you, too. The main reason for this podcast and every podcast I've ever done is to build community. So take your own challenge. Then join our Facebook group. It's called 1000 What's Your Challenge? Question mark. That's 1000 What's Your Challenge? Question mark. And post about what your 1000 challenge is and the progress you're making. All I ask is that people be encouraging of each other's challenges. This is personal and vulnerable, so be cool. There's enough negativity on social media. We don't need to add to it. For those of you who aren't on Facebook, hopefully in the future we'll be expanding to places like Discord, Reddit. But for now, we're starting on Facebook. And again, that Facebook group is called 1000 What's Your Challenge. See you there.